from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today from the Farm Service Agency, David Shem will provide more details on the next round of USDA market facilitation program payments, applications for which are now being taken. He'll point out the changes in the payment guidelines that have been made compared to last year's MFP payments. Then K-State's Rich Llewellyn will preview the 2019 Risk and Profit Conference here at the university. It's coming up in August, very soon now. This year's theme is Policy Perplexity. Rich will tell us what that's all about. And K-State's Charlie Lee on a new study of fladry as a method of warding coyotes away from livestock. He'll explain what that is later on, on this Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of Agriculture Today. Well, last week, as you know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture released the much-anticipated rates for the next round of market facilitation program payments. And uh, the USDA is now open for business on that particular program at your local FSA offices. We've invited by from the Farm Service Agency State Headquarters for Kansas, the state director of the FSA, David Shem, who has been feverishly gathering information on the MFP payment ever since that announcement came out last Thursday, David. And this is a very important matter, obviously, and the details are now falling into place pretty well, aren't they? Yeah, they're falling into place. Again, we got the payment rates that were released the other week, and obviously a lot of interest. Uh, we know a lot of producers have been reaching out to our offices and inquiring and wondering. And, of course, opening up here uh, on July 29th, the sign-up did begin running through December 6th. And, you know, we've already had a lot of interest uh, by producers getting into our offices and wanting to know a little bit more about it. You know, our offices here we have received some uh, national training just uh, recently here, uh, right before we did start the sign-up program. So we're, we're trying to help producers. We still have, uh, you know, a lot of questions on areas that, uh, as we're helping and producers work through the uh, sign-up form for it. But actually, the form is, is relatively straightforward. Producers can go in and apply even now. Producers, by the same token, should not expect the payment process to turn around quite this rapidly. It'll take some time, you say. No, exactly right. You know, we're expecting uh, payments to start uh, coming out the latter part of August. So, you know, some of these details as we continue to learn some more uh, policies on it and, and figure out for sure what some of the questions are that our producers have, we can definitely help walk them through the form. Uh, you know, it is a pretty straightforward form here, Eric. It's, it's a CCC 913. Producers can actually uh, print it off for themselves off of the website, farmers.gov, or obviously go into a local FSA office. And the form was designed to be pretty simple and straightforward there. In the nature of this program, I think it's going to be simple for those producers where their 2019 planted acres do not exceed their 2018 planted acres. Uh, however, for those producers out there, that in cases that, that they do have their planted acres in 2019 exceed their 2018, uh, it's going to be a little bit more uh, detailed work to be able to refine that down to see uh, what they would actually get payment on. You say, as we're on that point, there may be some exceptions to that acreage limitation. Those will be on an individual basis, case Ex by case. Exactly. So, and that's where, uh, you know, our offices definitely can work uh, with the producers. And like I mentioned earlier, as we have questions and, and we're getting those questions flushed out and finding out the answers for sure on them, there are some things that we do know and situations where, you know, a, a beginning farmer or a farmer picks up additional farm ground to farm in 2019 and that causes his planted acres to go above his 2018, uh, those can fall within the accepted acres. Uh, 
um, we actually, from a, a practical world, we come back in and look at the records on those fields that he picked up from 2018 and can add that back in so that he can increase what uh, his planted acres would be for 2019. There's also other accepted acres, uh, such as CRP being brought back into production. Uh, those can also be accepted acres. And then, of course, uh, as we definitely go uh, towards the central and western part of the state, the question is going to be on the fallow acres. And again, fallow acres can be an accepted acre. It's part of a rotation. And so if the producer's uh, 2019 uh, acres are, are higher than 2018, in 2018 he had those fallow acres, we can come back in and add that in to be able to help him get paid on the uh, amount that he planted in 2019. So like I said, the form is pretty straightforward when we look at it. I've got a sheet right in front of me here, uh, Eric, and for, for dairy and hog, it's, it's the unit of measure is, is hundred weight and head. Uh, it's got what the actual production for hundred weight on, on dairy is and, and on hog, it's an inventory. And on, on the uh, non-specialty crops, with like the corn, the soybeans, and the wheat, it's just basically what are your 2019 acres were and uh, if you have cover crop acres. And that's all a farmer has to do. Again, the caveat comes back in for the uh, county offices as they work with those producers as if those acres for 2019 exceed 2018. And we do, David, need to mention how prevent planted acres are being dealt with within the auspices of this program. There is eligibility there if one goes through the proper steps. Absolutely, Eric, and I'm glad you mentioned that because obviously with the uh, how would we say, very unique spring that we have had this year with the flooding, the excess moisture, and the challenges that our producers faced out there. There was a lot of prevent plant out there. So underneath the market facilitation program, those producers who plant a cover crop on that prevent plant acres are eligible to receive a $15 per acre rate for that cover crop. Uh, there is a deadline to be able to plant that cover crop. They need to get it planted here by August 1st. Two days from now. Just Two stress. days from now. So uh, I, I understand they, they may, depending upon the situation, be running on a, a very tight schedule there of, of getting that in. But no, they can plant an approved cover crop into those acres and then be also eligible for that. And as noted the other day, I know in all the producers out there, and this would also include, obviously, our prevent plant cover crop acres there, producers will get at least a $15 per acre payment to start the program or 50% of their total payment and that first tranche of payments that go out. How will double crops after wheat be considered under the guidelines of the program? Glad you asked that. Uh, another question that we've had coming in a lot. So there are areas of the state that would qualify for a, a, uh, a double crop or, or, or two payments upon the same acreage there. Uh, the term would be uh, following another crop or, or FAC there. Uh, there are six counties in southeast Kansas that are approved for double crop or FAC, soybeans behind uh, wheat stubble there. So those six counties uh, would qualify for an additional round of MFP payment on that second set of acres. Very well. We've not yet talked about the core information that triggered the program to kick into effect the county rates. Remind us of how those were calculated. Well, there's been a lot of discussion, obviously, and in, in interest concerning how those rates were developed for that. Uh, as I'm understanding, the, uh, the office of the chief economist is writing up a, a, an explanation on, on the trade damage that has, has happened. From my understanding, that is uh, that report is supposed to be released here in the next couple of weeks here that will help to explain where a lot of these county rates did come from. But uh, some of the things that we are aware of is, is that basically it looks at the county and basically the type of crops that are grown within the county, the amount of crops, and basically multiplies that by a rate for all of those. And then that was helped to determine what a, a county rate was across the nation, across the state here. Uh, as noted by, by the secretary, you know, those county payment rates uh, range from a 15 to $150 uh, nationwide. Uh, in Kansas, we, we range from a, a $25 to a $73, depending on parts of the uh, uh, state. 
So again, it's it's a little bit of a you know we're not sure exactly what all the factors that went into figuring those rates, but uh, hopefully here in a couple of weeks we'll be able to know a little bit more. And when folks look at those rates, if there are adjoining counties where the rates may not be as equitable as one might think, they need to hear what the secretary has to say about those rate determinations. Yeah, I, I think I think people have to be a little bit patient and, and wait for more information and to try to figure out a little bit where it comes from. I would just remind them that from our, our FSA county office people, they were uh, not a part of determining that rate. You know, they are taking what's been issued out by USDA and, and making sure we get it into those producers' hands there. So, you know, again, as we find out more information, I think everybody is really interested in knowing. One important facet of all of this, David, that you want to clarify, the limitations as per a producer's actual earning power, if you will, the adjusted gross income, that has uh, shifted some from the previous MFP payouts last year. Yeah, very much so. Uh, There is a slight uh, change in the AGI of the 900,000 on that. If a producer out there has a a 900,000 AGI uh, or higher, uh, they may still be eligible for these payments if at least 75% of their income comes from farming. Uh, One thing I will also mention with that is that rule there has also been applied retroactive to the first round of payments uh, in 18 that was based upon production. So uh, if there are producers out there that have a higher 900,000 or higher AGI but still have 75% of their income derived from farming, they can come into our offices as well and apply for that 2018 MFP payment uh, as well as obviously the 2019 MFP payment. Well, the basics are in place, but you would implore upon producers to work with their local FSA personnel and to get this business done in a relatively expedient fashion. Yeah, very much. I encourage our producers out there to get a hold of that local FSA office and and work with them as they get a lot of questions and and they flesh out those questions so they can be able to answer and help the producers walk through the application there, get signed up for the program. Again, we're expecting payments to start being issued uh, the latter part of August. Uh, Offices are busy out there, but obviously very eager to try to help producers. Um, We know there's definitely uh, producers uh, in areas of the state, throughout the state, that have been challenged challenged with tough economic times with uh, the prices of commodities and everything like that. So we know there's a lot of interest out there in this program, and we definitely want to get it into producers' hands. Well, we appreciate you, David, coming over. You've been scrambling to gather everything and anything available on the MFP program and the payment structure that's been put together as business is now being taken for that. We'll talk again soon. Thanks for coming over. Thank you. David Shim with us, the State Director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, a full preview of an event that's hosted each year by the Agricultural Economics Department here at K-State. It is a highly informative session for agricultural producers and others allied with the agricultural industry. The 2019 Risk and Profit Conference has been set for August the 22nd and 23rd here on the K-State campus at the Alumni Center. Over now to give us a quick rundown of what's ahead for this year's conference, Rich Llewellyn. Rich is an Extension Assistant in Agricultural Economics at K-State and the coordinator of this program, which amazingly enough, you say Rich is now in its 24th year, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. It's been going well, and 
Remind us of the purpose, if you will, of risk and profit. Well, it's an opportunity for our faculty to uh, present some of the hot topics they've been working on, applied things that are helpful to farmers and lenders. Uh, A lot of the crowd is uh, producers who come in, but we also have ag lenders. Uh, We have crop insurance agents, uh, county extension agents that uh, come for it, as well as some agribusiness folks. And so it's an opportunity for the faculty not only to present those things to those folks, but for... uh, those folks to interact with the faculty and kind of help our faculty understand what's going on out in the ag world. It's an extremely well-balanced program every year. Touches upon a whole slew of contemporary topics in agriculture. Is there a central theme this year, though? Well, we're looking at policy a little more, given that the Farm Bill is coming up and the decision for that. It was passed uh, back earlier in the year, and uh, so we have that, as well as all the stuff going on with trade and uh, the issues associated with that and the MFP payments. Uh, So there's quite a bit related. Our theme, actually, is policy perplexity. (laughs) So uh, Which is apropos. (laughs) It very very much is. (laughs) And in fact, your opening speaker is somebody who's well immersed in that policy perplexity in a professional sense, right? Yes, she is. Uh, Sarah Wyant is the uh, president of AgriPulse Communications, and uh, she has uh, a lot of connections in Washington, D.C., and has been there for quite a few years. She understands what's going on there and is involved quite a bit in the ag side of uh, things going on legislatively. So uh, we're going to ask her to uh, do just a Washington update of what's going on, especially related to trade and and some uh, policies uh, related to that, but also uh, the Farm Bill and things looking ahead to the next Farm Bill even. Uh, We're still five years out from that discussion, but there are some things that are coming down the pike with that. She is a well-known agricultural communicator, has tremendous insight on all manner of ag policy, ag trade issues from the Beltway, if you will. And Sarah Wyatt from AgriPulse Communications will be the opening speaker to start the program on Thursday, the 22nd of August. And then it gets into that long lineup of breakout sessions, largely hosted by K-State Agricultural Economics faculty and staff. 19 such sessions, you say, Rich? There are. uh, Each of those are presented twice as well, so there's an opportunity to catch seven of those during the conference, uh, four opportunities uh, for the breakout sessions on Thursday, and then three more times on Friday for that. So out of the 19, folks can choose seven of those and get to uh, what they're interested in. There's a lot of different things going on with that. Well, we won't walk through all 19, but as you look at the lineup, what jumps out to you? Well, the first thing up is is the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, the sign-up for that's going to start in September, so the timing is such that uh, it's not very long before sign-up, and so we'll have some presentations on uh, that, especially related to the uh, ARC and PLC programs, uh, but also some stuff on supplemental coverage option. And then also the trade conflict. Uh, we have a couple of sessions on that by Nathan Hendricks as well as Alan Featherstone. And then the uh, other thing is uh, related to Kansas land values, not policy, but uh, something people are very interested in. We have two presentations on that, one by Michael Taylor, just on what land values are doing in Kansas. And then Gabe Sampson has a related uh, session on the effect of wind turbines, uh, groundwater stocks, and irrigation on land values in Kansas. Uh, the other thing I just mentioned is some stuff on farm finance and farm incomes. There's a couple of sessions that are offered uh, related to those topics. And that's just a sampling. And producers, once again, as you say, can basically tailor the program to their needs by picking and choosing from these sessions. Yes, absolutely. And there's some other topics that uh, they can find on the brochure um, that are different than what was mentioned there. Now, Rich, there is a special session in the evening of the 22nd that was conceptualized a few years ago. You and the team that put this conference on came up with the idea of welcoming in a leading agricultural producer to share their story and their perspectives on succeeding in agriculture, and no exception this year. That's correct. And so this Thursday night of the conference, uh, we'll have Phil and Sharon Knox, uh, a couple from northwest Kansas near Brewster. We try to have people from different parts of the state each year, and so northwest Kansas is uh, where we're looking this year. Uh, Phil and Sharon have a little bit different situation. Uh, One thing that's different is they have an associated agribusiness that 
helps market some of the grain that they have uh, that uh, they produce on their farm. The other thing that's going on is they don't have a clear succession uh, or a successor to the farm uh, at this point. And so it's a little different situation than some of the other farms we've had where there is a son or a daughter that is coming back and, and working into the farm. And so they're going to discuss some of the things they're looking at with that. And that's a very casual, interactive session with the producers and the audience. Yes, it is. And so there's a, it's a question and answer format. And uh, then there's opportunities for people to ask questions about it. We've been really pleased with how farmers have just shared what's going on and, and been really pretty open with uh, their situation and some of the struggles they've had as well as some of the successes. It's called A Conversation with a Kansas Farmer. Again, Phil and Sharon Knox of Brewster will be featured at Brisk and Profit this time around. Then the next day, the 23rd, the program largely concludes with the outlooks on the commodity markets featuring K-State talent. Right. The first session on Friday morning is Dan O'Brien with the grain markets and looking ahead. Uh, this is especially important uh, for people that are looking at the uh, Farm Bill programs, ARC and PLC, because prices are a very important component of which program they should choose. So there will be some outlook related to that, as well as just the marketing side of it and what people ought to be doing with the crops they're going to have this year. Then uh, at noon will be the Livestock Outlook uh, by Glenn Tonzer, and he'll be looking at primarily the beef market, but also some of the uh, other uh, livestock markets in Kansas, and uh, looking ahead a little bit to what he sees going on on the demand side as well as on the supply side of things. Uh, In between, we're going to have three breakout sessions again. So the idea here, and you've hinted at this a couple of times, is for those participants attending Risk and Profit Conference to bring their questions and feel free to raise those questions to the speakers as they take in the session. Yes, that's very true. Uh, We have 50-minute breakout sessions, and we encourage the speakers to take only about 30 to 40 minutes for the actual presentation to allow, you know, 15, 20 minutes for questions that people might have or discussion on, on what's going on with that particular topic. All right. Well, this year's edition of the Risk and Profit Conference, amazingly enough, is less than a month away. So, Rich, what are the procedures for registering? Well, our agmanager.info website has the uh, information for the conference uh, listed under the events section of the site. And so folks could go there or uh, they could contact me. Uh, My email is rvl at ksu.edu, and I could get them the information they need to register on that. But it is on the website, and they could click through and and register themselves. The uh, deadline for registration is August 19th. Uh, Actually, we allow walk-ins, but the registration fee goes up after August 19th. Uh, The fee is uh, $225 for uh, both days. Or just for one day, it would be $150. And that covers all proceedings? Yes, all proceedings, meals, uh, parking, everything like that. So it really is a bargain for what you're getting from this program. We feel it is. This is a pretty high-quality program and a lot of good things going on with it. And that is evidenced by how well attended it is each and every year. So you put together a tremendous program. Policy perplexities is the topic that ought to, in and of itself, raise quite a dialogue amongst producers and presenters at this particular conference. Rich, thanks for the look ahead to it. The best of luck in putting the finishing touches on the program and launching it here in the not-too-distant future. We will see you at Risk and Profit. All right. Thanks much, Eric. Rich Llewellyn with us, Extension Assistant in Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University and one of those instrumental in putting together that Risk and Profit Conference every year. Again, the 2019 edition is set for Thursday and Friday, August the 22nd and 23rd. The venue, as it has been in recent years, the Alumni Center on the Kansas State University campus. To register, well, check out the full information at agmanager.info. If you'd like to get a hold of Rich directly. It's as easy as emailing him at rvl at ksu.edu. That's rvl at ksu.edu. And we hope to see you at the Risk and Profit Conference in a few weeks right here at K-State. This is Agriculture Today. Now we'll break away for a few moments. When we come back, today's agricultural news headlines for you. That'll include this week's crop progress update for Kansas out of the USDA. K-State's Mike Brook awaits with milk lines. 
and K-State's Charlie Lee with our wildlife management segment for the week. Still to come here on the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines in brief for you, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, it's turning a tad dry around Kansas, as indicated in the Crop Progress and Condition Report for the state this week from the USDA. And for the week ending this past Sunday, our topsoil moisture supplies at 2% surplus, 58% adequate, but now 40% short to very short. Subsoil moisture, 3% surplus, 74% adequate, 23% short to very short. The condition of the Kansas corn crop this week, 57% good to excellent, 31% rated fair, and 12% poor to very poor. Corn silking at 71%, that's behind the 86% for the five-year average on the date. Corn in the dough stage at 24% behind the 31% average. The Kansas soybean crop rates 50% good to excellent, 39% fair, 11% poor to very poor. Soybeans blooming at 40%, well behind the 66% average, and beans setting pods at 12%, well behind the 28% average. As for grain sorghum then, 69% rated good to excellent, 25% fair, 6% poor to very poor. Sorghum heading now is at 10%. That's behind the 26% average. And range and pasture conditions in the state, 69% still good to excellent, 26% fair, and 5% poor to very poor. The condition of the U.S. corn crop improved slightly last week. The National Agricultural Statistics Service pegging corn condition at 58% good to excellent as of Sunday. That was up 1% from the previous week, still the lowest good to excellent rating for this time of year in seven years. 18% of the corn in Illinois was rated poor to very poor. 58% of the corn silking as of Sunday, still 25% behind the five-year average of 83%. As for the status of the soybean crop nationally, here's the USDA's Gary Crawford. The condition of the nation's soybean crop holding fairly steady over this past week. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says there was no change in the good to excellent percentage, 54% of the beans still in that category. We did see a one-point increase in the very poor-to-poor rating from 12 to 13 percent. Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the crop rated very poor to poor. So a wide variance in conditions as far as crop development. 57 percent blooming on July 28th. That's a 35 point increase over the last two weeks, but still behind the five-year average of 79 percent and last year's 85%. And USDA reporting soybean setting pods as we start this week, 21%. The average is 45. Last year, we were at 58%. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And to round out the national story, winter wheat harvest moved ahead another 6% last week, reaching 75% completion as of Sunday, still behind the five-year average of 86%. And spring wheat heading nearly complete at 97% as of this past weekend, the five-year average right at 98%. Well, we have a quick reminder from our guest earlier in the broadcast, the Farm Service Agency's David Shem, the deadline for filing for county FSA committee elections is But two days away, as you know, those committees play an extraordinarily vital role in the administration of USDA programs locally. And David urges anyone with interest to get their hat in that ring right away. 
nomination deadlines are uh, this Thursday here, so would definitely encourage anybody that are interested or know of people that are interested to get in there and get those nomination forms in to your county offices. It is a very vital role that those county committees play for uh, FSA. USDA, particularly FSA, is so strongly connected with our producers out there, and those county committees are one of those vital components that truly help us to be responsive to our producers out there and truly hear and listen and, and try to help them with the situations they face. So please, if you're interested or, or, or know somebody interested, uh, get those nomination forms in here by this Thursday. The Farm Service Agency's David Shim there. Now it's time for Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to speak with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning a mastitis challenge that we generally face during the summer months. As the weather gets warmer, bacteria tend to multiply a lot quicker. One of those bacteria that we're concerned about in the dairy industry is E. coli. That's the type of bacteria that when we see this type of mastitis in our cattle, the cattle generally get very sick. The reason for that is that these particular bacteria do release endotoxins. Really not a lot we can do other than supportive therapy for the cow once these endotoxins are released. She has to basically fend off the challenge on her own with whatever supportive therapy that we can give her. So one of the things we try to concentrate on is trying to prevent contact with these type of bacteria. These bacteria are found in the environment, so as we think about summertime, one of the issues we have is heat stress, and during periods of heat stress, cattle generally like to seek wet areas to lay. So if you're giving animals access to ponds or creeks, whether they be lactating cows or dry cows, it is important to recognize that we increase our chances of animals contacting these E. coli bacteria as they go to these wet areas to lay. Also, even in our freestall barns, they will tend to seek out a wet area to lay there. So trying to keep the barns as clean as possible during the summer months is a very important part of trying to control the incidences of E. coli mastitis in your dairy herd. So that's the primary thing that we need to do on our farms is try to just control the access that the animal might have to the bacteria. So keeping those udders as clean as possible during the summertime, making sure we keep up on changing bedding and those sorts of things, very, very important. Second thing we can do is we can vaccinate the animals. This would be a vaccine like something called J5. It's specific for this type of bacteria and it does help control it in our herds. Maybe not prevent it, but actually control it. And if an animal does come down with E. coli mastitis, we generally have less of a severe reaction to the bacteria. So if you're not vaccinating your herd currently for E. coli mastitis, you need to visit with your veterinarian and discuss these types of control programs. In general, most of these immunizations need to be given more than once during the year. And a product like J5 generally recommends three doses in a year. So again, if you're not currently vaccinating, make sure that you visit with your herd veterinarian the next time he or she happens to visit your farm about starting this control program in your herd. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today is back now, as is Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension for his weekly segment on wildlife management. Charlie, so many ideas have been forwarded about controlling coyotes over the many years. And here's one that recently went through a round of testing. It's a non-lethal means called fladry. What is that exactly? Well, it's a non-lethal tool that's gaining some popularity among livestock producers and conservationists. And it's an effective tool that was developed to protect livestock in pastures from wolves. It 
consists of a single strand of flags that are approximately 20 inches by 4 inches. They're usually in a triangle shape that are hanging from a cord or a rope. Those are sewn onto a nylon rope at intervals of approximately 17, 18 inches apart. Then that acts as a repellent by taking advantage of the neophobic behavior of wolves because it stimulates a flight or startle response to deter them from an area where you're trying to protect usually livestock. So a frightening device in effect? It's a frightening device that is low-tech, and it's been used for several years on wolves. So other folks decided if it works on wolves, why won't it work on coyotes? Uh, It's been tried for coyotes, and like many other non-lethal tools, they've been experimentally tested and promoted without a lot of science based on some of those tools. So this was a test done by USDA, the National Wildlife Research Center in Millville, Utah, that tested Fladry for prevention of coyote crossing the line. The problem seemed to be that they thought the the flags were too far apart. The flags were 17 to 18 inches apart for wolves, and they thought they needed to reduce that because coyotes simply went between the flags and crossed the line. So they decided to do a test where they would compare the flags that were 10 inches apart versus the ones that were pre-made for wolves at 17 inches. These uh, flags are then held just above the ground and the motion in uh, the wind, you know, moves them around and it usually frightens the critters away. You have to have quite a string of flags, though, to protect any size of area, don't you? Yes, and keep in mind, these are typically done for short-term protection in small enclosures. So we're not using this type of a device to protect the entire perimeter of a pasture. It's usually perhaps a night pen or something where you're lambing, where it's a much smaller area to be enclosed. Just simply did not appear to be appropriate nor effective for coyotes. So Mm. they tried to come up with ways to make it more effective, and the goal was to move the flags closer together and then perhaps change the way that those flags were attached to the rope because sometimes they simply tangled in the rope and then didn't blow in the wind. So they compared two attachment designs, one which was more of a shower curtain, and the other one where it was knotted at the top of the rope so it wouldn't slide down to one end or the other. Then they had captive coyotes that were captured at times in the past and held in pens that were approximately 40 acres in size. They took a small area inside that pen, used the fladry to enclose that small area, and then fed coyotes inside the area that was protected by the fladry and checked with motion cameras and uh, visual observation to see how frequently and how quick coyotes crossed the fladry. And did the denser flag arrangement make a difference at all then? Yes, the fladry with the smaller gaps between the flags uh, had a greater efficacy in preventing coyote crossings than the fladry with the larger gaps. They also determined that For each additional minute that the coyotes spent interacting with the fladry overall, the survival or the effectiveness of that barrier decreased. So coyotes in this particular case seemed to be able to learn fairly quickly that there was nothing really to fear there. And the longer they spent messing around, uh, checking out the fladry, then the, the quicker they crossed the line. Now, pointing out, as you mentioned, these were pin-reared coyotes, not coyotes exclusively in the wild. So was that a difference maker in the results here? Well, I think that's probably part of it. Keep in mind, these were captive-reared coyotes that had been used to humans. There was not a lot of, uh, of their natural food inside these pens, so they were conditioned, if you will, to, to go to where the food was. And all of the test coyotes crossed the, that control boundary for food on the first day of the, of the testing behavior. So coyotes crossed the Fladry barrier seven out of the 16 trials. Uh, no coyotes crossed it within the first day. More than one coyote crossed it on the day two. 
and the, most of the coyotes cross before day four. So if this is going to be an effective control technique, I suspect it's going to be short-term effectiveness, and it's not something that I, I think I would particularly use to try to protect my herd for a very long period of time. So once again, you can uh, throw this into the basket with other non-lethal approaches to coyote control, which really haven't panned out as well as those with livestock or others would prefer. Well, I, I think it just shows that when we're dealing with wildlife damage control situations, we need to be flexible, willing to try a broad range of techniques until we find one that's effective. As we've talked many times in the past, good perimeter fencing, that is a physical barrier, uh, seems to be more effective than some of the non-lethal approaches that would be repellents. I would consider fladry to be a repellent of sorts. Uh, it's not a chemical, but it's a motion-activated, wind-activated product that's designed to scare animals away from the area. It just appeared within this test that the effectiveness of the fladry is not going to be the technique to use for coyote protection. And once again, as confirmed by this recent USDA field evaluation of fladry, a system of hanging flags as a potential deterrent to coyotes, we appreciate the report on this, Charlie. Many thanks. He's a wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee. And that caps off our Tuesday edition. Remember, our podcast service is available to you anytime for either listening or automatically downloading to your mobile device. Check into that at agtoday.net. That's agtoday.net. Meantime, please rejoin us right here tomorrow, won't you? Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.